Here in chapter 13, we are going to talk about control of microbial growth. So first, we're going to talk about the different biosafety levels. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about different ways that we can control microbial growth, um, meaning things everywhere from you know, sterilization and all the way down to you know, things like disinfectant or you know, removing bacterial pathogens or, or just bacteria in general. Um, so first, let's start with our biosafety levels. Uh, first of all, we have things called PPE, which are personal protective equipment. And so we're going to talk about the different types of PPE for these biosafety levels as well. So our lowest biosafety level is BSL-1, biosafety level 1. And as you can see in the table over here, um, the description for biosafety level 1 is just microbes that are not our microbes are not known to cause disease in healthy hosts and pose minimal risk to workers in the environment. So um, some examples are in the next column here. So non-pathogenic strains of E. coli is the example. So BSL level one are things that we are using in our laboratory at the college, for example. Um, so the non-pathogenic strains of various things. So we have our staph epidermidis, we have our luteus, we have our uh, Stratia marquesans, we have our E. coli, all of these different things where there may be pathogenic versions of these, but what we're utilizing in our laboratory and in BSL level one um, places, um, these are all non-pathogenic. So when we're talking about non-pathogenic, then we're just speaking about things like wearing a lab coat just so it doesn't spill on you, uh, wearing goggles sometimes, and wearing gloves so that things don't get transferred from one place to another place. Now, just slightly up from that is our BSL level 2. So in our BSL level 2, uh, this is when we have microbes that are typically indigenous and are associated with diseases of varying severity. Um, so they pose a moderate risk. So these are things that we do have in our environment that we do work with and we see and we get sick with generally um, in that area. That's the indigenous part. So in, for example, where we're at in North America, these BSL level two are things that um, pose a moderate risk to become infectious or cause disease. And these would be things like Staphylococcus aureus. So um, people have Staphylococcus aureus um, in their body, on their body. Um, sometimes, however, it does cause disease, so it's a moderate level, however. So for BSL level 2, um, when we're talking about locations that are a BSL level 2 or deal with organisms at a BSL level 2, they need to have self-closing doors so that when we have things on our hands, for example, we don't open doors and then transfer that to the handle. So uh, self-closing doors, an eye wash station. Um, so that if anything does get in the eyes, it can be washed out because, again, it's possible it could be pathogenic. And an autoclave, so an autoclave so that it can completely kill as many organisms as possible um, when you're working with it. <clears throat> then the next level up from that is our BSL-3. In our BSL-3, we have microbes that are indigenous or exotic. Um, so this is where we're getting things that are outside of the region, so outside of North America, for example, and then can cause serious or potentially lethal diseases. So mycobacterium tuber tuberculosis is an example here. So um, these are potentially lethal, and they are potentially lethal through respiratory transmission. So if we breathe them in, for example, um, it could cause disease and it could cause a lethal disease or could be very serious. So in BSL level three, um, laboratories and uh, research locations, these people need to use a respirator when they're working because, again, it could be through respiratory transmission that they could acquire these things, and it could be lethal. Also, they work with organisms in a biological safety cabinet. So down here, this image is showing a biological safety cabinet. It's kind of like a fume hood um, where organisms are going to be utilized or going to be manipulated within this cabinet. Um, so this woman actually, what she has on is stuff from BSL level four, but the cabinet here is very similar to a BSL level three cabinet uh, where you're working with it within the cabinet. It has the fume hood going, you know, the fumes going, the vacuum going, so it's pulling anything out um, and not getting it into the room or getting it on the person, but going out. And then there are filters to help filter it out so it doesn't actually get out, out, as in out of the room and in other spaces. Then our BSL level four is our most dangerous level. So this is where the microbes are dangerous and exotic. They pose a high risk uh, for aerosol transmitted infections and then frequently fatal. So without treatment, without vaccines, and 
as it mentions, very few labs are at this level. So there are only very few labs that are going to take on something of this severity. So these are places that are working with Ebola, for example, or Marburg viruses. So in BSL level four, uh, this is where we have multiple rooms that are associated with the lab space. And so a person will need to change their clothes upon entering and then shower upon exiting. So typically there's a room ahead of the actual laboratory space. So the person will walk into the room, the first room. Um, all of these will have um, doors that are self-closing. So walk into the first room, then they will take their clothes off and put other clothes on, something similar to what this woman is wearing, although she might have clothes, other clothes that are on underneath. Um, but then they'll take the clothes off, put the clothes on, including something like what this woman is wearing, a full body protective suit. Um, and then once they have a full body protective suit on, which is uh, down here, and a full body protective suit, <clears throat> they'll have that on, they'll have the gloves on, everything will be covered. You can even see here um, that she has a sort of respirator that's attached to the actual suit. So that's put on. Then they walk from that first room into the laboratory room. And sometimes there's even an additional room there. So in the first room is where you change. And then in the second room is where you uh, make sure that you're basically decontaminated. There's an extra space there. And then you can walk into the laboratory. Then once you walk into the laboratory, you're already in the protective equipment, um, including this full body protective suit that has higher air pressure within the suit so that um, anything that is outside or in the environment is not coming into the suit um, because the higher air pressure is inside the suit, then it's pushing anything out. So even if something were to be um, an aerosol or, or could be in the air, then it's going to be um, hopefully stay out of the suit instead of going into the suit. They also use a biological safety cabinet here with our double HEPA filters. That's what she's using here as well. And then once the laboratory work is done, then the person walks out into a separate room and then they will likely take off all of the um, protective suit and all of the special equipment. <clears throat> Then they'll go into the next room and they'll take a shower and change into regular clothes. Um, and then also before they do that, they need to decontaminate all materials prior to exiting. Um, so again, very, very high level. You can see over here by the CDC classification um, that it's very small all the way up the top, very red. So when we talk about protocols um, for decreasing or stopping microbial growth or killing microbes. Um, we're going to talk about a, a, several different protocols and, and the pros and cons and how they work. So the first protocol that we're going to look at is sterilization. So there are different ways that we can sterilize things. We can sterilize them physically or we can sterilize them chemically. So physically, some examples would be like high heat. Uh, for example, putting something in a, a flame would sterilize it, <clears throat> similar to our inoculating loops in our laboratory. Um, or along with pressure, something like the autoclave. So high heat and pressure in an autoclave um, can sterilize things. Or we can do filtration through an appropriate filter. So we can, if we have an appropriate filter, then we can sterilize the solution by making sure that we filter out all of the organisms, including viruses. So these are physical means, actually physically uh, removing them or using physical means. And then chemical means, we can use what are called sterilants. So sterilants are things that kill all microbes, viruses, and over time, endospores. So over time means that it doesn't kill them right away. So endospores are very resilient. Oftentimes we can apply some sort of sterilant to um, a solution or to something, and it will kill everything except for the endospores. Um, but if we had continued applying the sterilant to the surface or the solution, then the endospores over time would then be destroyed. Um, but in just small periods of time, that may not be the case. So one technique is a septic technique, uh, which is something that we have gone over in the laboratory, so making sure that we're not contaminating things. This is a way to maintain sterility, so asepsis, a meaning without, and then without sepsis, which is down here. So sepsis is our systemic inflammatory response to infection. So sepsis is when our body is going to respond to an infection with things like high fever, 
increased heart and respiratory rates, shock, and then even possibly death. So um, it can be very, very severe, which is why it's important that we maintain aseptic technique, particularly when we're talking about something like sepsis, is in the um, medical field, for example. So we want to maintain an aseptic field. And this is, of course, to prevent contamination of the patient, of ourselves, of the equipment, like that. Um, so failure to practice this aseptic technique can sometimes lead to sepsis. So what we try to do in the medical field is maintain a sterile field. So this is a designated area kept free of all microbes. This is typically during medical procedure protocols. So for example, if somebody goes in to have a surgery, what will happen is, um, say it's under general anesthesia, a person will be put under, <clears throat> they'll be in the, the room, then um, whatever part of the body that is being operated on will be exposed, and then they will utilize um, some sort of chemical uh, sterilant or some other disinfectants that we'll be talking about. And then that area is considered a sterile field. So nothing goes into, on, above that field. Everybody in the room, everybody in the, in the surgical room is, knows that that's the sterile field. And so nothing that's not sterile can come near it. Then there's also commercial sterilization. So when we hear the terms commercial sterilization, this is when we use high heat to destroy common pathogens in food. So food po are responsible for food poisoning and food spoilage. Now this is kind of a misnomer, so I want you to be aware of that, that when we say commercial sterilization, it actually does not kill all the microorganisms. So um, this is still just the best case scenario for food. Um, they say it's commercial sterilization, but it is not because we're not killing every single live organism there because oftentimes we find endospores. So for example, we have Clostridium botulinum, um, which is found in the soil and it can easily contaminate food during harvesting. So since it's found in the soil, when people go in or machines go in, go in and they harvest the products, they can easily pick up um, Clostridium botulinum, either vegetative cells or endospores if they're already in sporulation. And then when they go through the process of commercial sterilization, they don't end up killing those endospores. They end up being packaged with the product. Uh, and this is where we see um, cans of canned food that can bulge. And this is because they go through the canning process, which is meant to kill everything because it goes through commercial sterilization, but it does not. And so then that um, botulinum is able to grow inside of the can and it, then it's going to produce gases. And when it produces gases, it actually makes the canned food bulge out or that, that tinned food bulge out. The next protocol that we're going to look at is called disinfection. <clears throat> So in disinfection, this is when we're going to inactivate most microbes using chemicals or heat. So in this case, uh, this is our step down. So when we started with sterilization, sterilization is the most extreme version. In sterilization, what we're talking about with the exception of commercial sterilization is that everything is dead. Everything is killed, everything is gone. So nothing is living um, inside of whatever it is we're talking about. Now the step down from that is disinfection. So this is where we inactivate most microbes. So we can use chemicals and heat. So some microbes and endospores will remain. It's not sterile. <clears throat> so the reason we would use disinfectants or some qualifications of disinfectants are that they are fast acting, um, stable, easy to prepare, inexpensive, easy to use on inanimate items, which are called fomites. So some of the disinfectants that we use kind of at home are things like vinegar or chlorine bleach, for example, or Lysol. You can see some of the examples here. Um, so, you know, things that we spray down counters with sometimes, like the 409 and the Lysol and the bleach, all of these things are disinfectants, which means that they inactivate most microbes. So that's why we see on the, the bottle of Clorox or Lysol, you know, it kills 99.9% of bacteria or viruses, whatever they say on that container, because they can't say it kills 100% because then that would be a sterilant uh, and they would be lying because it's not going to kill those endospores. Uh, the next protocol is antisepsis. So against sepsis, antisepsis. And this is the process of applying something called an antiseptic. So antisepsis is a protocol of applying antiseptics. An antiseptic 
is an antimicrobial chemical. So when we are talking about antisepsis and utilizing antiseptics, antiseptics can be used on living skin or tissues. This is different from a disinfectant. Um, we don't want to wash our hands with bleach, for example. Um, it's not advised to wash our hands with Lysol or advised to wash our hands with uh, Clorox wipes or something like that. Um, that's not what they're used for. That's what on the container they say it's an irritant, um, can cause damage or can kill living tissue. Um, but antiseptics, on the other hand, are safe for use on living tissue or living skin. So these are uh, selectively effective against microbes. They are able to penetrate tissues deeply, but they don't cause tissue damage. So some of these things are hydrogen peroxide, which we can use on tissues. Oftentimes people use hydrogen peroxide um, as a mouthwash because it is very good at killing microbes, um, but it doesn't kill the tissue, it doesn't damage the tissue. And also things like isopropyl alcohol. So isopropyl alcohol is something that perhaps you've used previously because it kills organisms or used it on certain things to kill organisms. Another example is iodine that's here in the table. And iodine is one of those things that we see used, specifically the brand called Betadine, that's used in surgeries. So it, when a person goes in for that surgery, I already mentioned that sterile field. Mm -hmm. In that sterile field, what they oftentimes are using to wipe down um, the person prior to opening them up, prior to surgery, is Betadine. They, they wipe and swab the entire area and the area around it before they do the surgery, before they cut into a person. So in this case, we can clean the skin. Um, also, maybe um, you've used iodine to uh, decontaminate a cut or, or disinfect or antisep go antisepsis um, because it does kill so many organisms, and it's also safe for your skin. Uh, the next level down then is de-germing. So de-germing just decreases microbial numbers. It doesn't really get rid of all of a specific type or it doesn't get rid of 99.9%. Um, here we're just saying this is something we can use to decrease the numbers of microbes. So it removes most of them though. And when we talk about de-germing, really what we're talking about is hand washing. Hand washing, wiping the skin with an alcohol swab, um, and then just gently scrubbing. So again, gently scrubbing living tissue, commonly skin with a mild chemical, mild chemical meaning soap or alcohol, and then this is just meant to decrease things. So when we are washing our hands, for example, we are actually de-germing our hands. Um, de-germing them meaning we're going to use soap, which is a mild chemical, to try to facilitate getting rid of most of the microbes on our skin. The next one is st sanitation. So sanitation, we're kind of switching from things that can be used on living tissue, like the antiseptics and like de-germing with the mild uh, chemicals, to sanitation is on other things, so not on living tissue. <clears throat> so this is for the cleansing of fomites, which are objects, inanimate objects, to remove enough microbes to achieve levels that are deemed safe for public health. And so depending on what we're talking about is going we are going to have a different level. So whatever is deemed safe for that particular level. So um, for commercial dishwashing, for example, um, of utensils in a restaurant, there's a certain level of bacterial contamination that's acceptable. Sanitization is just getting things down below that level. Uh, for example, cleaning public restrooms. Again, there's a certain level that is acceptable. And so sanitization is just saying we're cleaning these inanimate objects to get them down or decrease the amount of microbes that are on there. So it reduces the microbial load here on an inanimate object. And then this is related to public health, so commercial dishwashers, uh, chemical disinfectants in hospital rooms, things like that. So this table is uh, from the text. These are common protocols for the control of microbial growth. Note that it separates it here for use on fomites and then for use on living tissue. <clears throat> and so we have our disinfection, sanitation, and sterilization that are all for use on fomites. Right? And then we have antisepsis and de-germing that are used on living tissue, so things that are not going to harm our skin. So you should be familiar with these things, know what they're used on, um, some examples of things that are used. 
uh, basically a lot of what's happening in this table here. So when do we use a particular protocol? The type of protocol used depends on a couple of things. It depends on the item to be cleaned and our desired level of cleanliness. So when we're talking about cleaning our hands versus cleaning a surgical instrument, um, I think we all know that there are different levels that are acceptable. Uh, so, and also we know that we would use different things to clean a surgical instrument, for example, compared to cleaning our hands. We certainly wouldn't be sticking our hands in an autoclave, for example. So then we can classify the items that we're talking about in three different levels here. So critical items, semi-critical items, and then non-critical items as the lowest. So our critical items are things that must be sterile. Um, so this is the example of a surgical instrument. So it's for use inside the body, so it must be sterile. We can't bring even a low amount or an endospore or something and put it into a body. That would be very dangerous. So something that's for use inside the body. Um, so something like a catheter, for example. <clears throat> anything that's penetrating sterile tissues, meaning penetrating anything that's inside the body, um, or sterile tissues, meaning... Um, for transplants and things, they sterilize the tissues and bring them in before they transplant them, or in the bloodstream. So again, we have surgical instruments, catheters, intravenous fluids, um, things that are going to be going inside of a person's body typically is considered a critical item. Then we have our semi-critical items, which require disinfection. So these may contact, contact uh, mucous membranes or non-intact skin, but they don't penetrate tissues. So in this case, this would be like an endoscope. So um, sometimes they put a scope down in through the uh, throat and then goes down to see things like, say, inside of the stomach, for example, um, so that they can see an ulcer maybe. And so this endoscope needs to be disinfected, right? We don't want to get anything in the person's body, but it doesn't need to be sterile because we wouldn't be able to sterilize something that is equipment like that, for example. Um, or non-intact skin, for example. So um, respiratory therapy equipment is another example of something that can contact mucous membranes. But non-intact skin would be um, bandages, for example. We don't Perhaps we don't take um, gauze and put it through something to sterilize it because it could destroy the gauze. Instead, we have that as disinfected. We could have disinfected. We, we may also have some sterile gauze, but um, something that is going to touch cut skin or not intact skin. Lastly, we have our non-critical items. So these are things that just need to be clean. Um, so they may contact but not penetrate skin. So bed linen. So at the hospital, they don't sterilize their bed sheets. They don't um, sterilize the pillowcase. What they do is they clean them, right? They put them in the washing machine just like we do. So bed linens, furniture in hospitals, crutches, stethoscopes, uh, blood pressure cuffs. So these are all things that just touch the surface of the skin. And so they don't need to have things like sterilization processes applied to them. So then when we measure microbial control, so um, we're talking about sterilizing things or disinfecting things or, you know, using an antiseptic or something, um, then we would need to measure microbial control, especially when we're talking about public health. So we have our naming of physical or chemical methods of microbial control. Um, so when we are talking about certain types of microbial control, we can use a suffix and a prefix. So those that kill the targeted microorganism, so if they kill it, then the suffix is side or cytal, so at the end is the suffix. And then the prefix is the type of microbe. So bactericide means that it kills bacteria, so kills it completely. Uh, if it's viricide, this is virus, kills viruses, and fungicide is killing fungus. Right, so the side at the end, and then at the beginning, we have the name of the microbe. So we also have things that just stop microorganisms from growing, but they don't kill them. When we have something that stops a microorganism from growing, that has the suffix of stat or static. And then, of course, the prefix is, again, the type of microbe. So we have bacteriostatic, 
means something that is going to stop bacterial growth. Or fungostatic is something that stops fungus growth. So the reason we would use something that would stop microbial growth but not actually kill them would be because, one, they're less toxic to humans. Um, so this is something we can apply to ourselves, and it's not going to kill our cells as well as the microbes. Also to the environment. Um, utilizing these things that are cytal, um, that can kill microorganisms, are much stronger, and therefore much stronger in the environment. If it's getting into the water and then getting out into the environment, it can cause some serious damage. And then preserve the integrity of the treated item. So again, we don't use our hands with certain sterilants. Um, and then also with certain fomites, right? So we wouldn't apply a particular chemical. Um, maybe bleach, if we think about it. That's not a sterilant. But if we think about applying bleach and soaking some fabric in bleach, at first, sure, it just makes a white spot. Or if it's already white, it'll make it cleaner. But if we sat there and allowed something to sit in bleach long enough to kill, say, endospores, for example, it would start to deteriorate the fabric. It starts to eat away at things. So that wouldn't be an appropriate um, method to use, for example. Uh, for our... Stats are static, are bacteriostatic things. Um, they are able to be impregnated into plastics. So we wouldn't want to put a sterilant, for example, or a side or a bactericide into something because that's going to end up killing bacteria all over the place, right? Even the good stuff. But we can impregnate our plastics with something that is static, like bacteriostatic, for example. And we see this in children's toys um, and then also in cutting boards, two examples of where we can put it into plastic. And then therefore we can decrease those pathogens from spreading. And this is particularly important with cutting boards, getting plastic cutting boards, and then using those plastic cutting boards that have bacteriostatic um, chemicals in them because then we can make sure that we're killing those pathogens. Uh, or at least stopping them from growing. And then we can wash them, and then hopefully there won't be enough growth to then cause disease. Also, it's used in treatment of infection in healthy individuals uh, so that the immune system can end up clearing the infection. This is a situation where if a person is healthy, we would want to give them some sort of chemical, if we choose to give them a chemical or they choose to take it, um, give them something to treat the infection, a lot of times when we give them something to treat the infection, what we're actually doing is just stopping the microorganisms from growing um, and not actually killing them. And the reason that we do that is so that their immune system can take over. Once the bacterial growth is stopped, then the immune system can take over and can start winning the fight. Um, what that does then is it allows for the exposure of the immune system to that pathogen, and then the immune system can learn from that. And we'll talk a lot more about that in Chapter 18 when we talk about the adaptive immune response and how when we are exposed to something a second time, which we kind of generally already know, which is the point of vaccines, we have a much stronger response, and oftentimes we don't get sick. So whether a treatment is going to kill all of the organisms or whether the treatment is going to just stop microbial growth depends on different things. One, it depends on the type of organism that's targeted. So perhaps some treatment is going to be applied to something, and if we're talking about one organism, maybe it's just static, maybe it just stops the growth. But if it's a different organism, it may actually kill the organism. Um, so in one case, it would be bacteriostatic, on these particular organisms, and then it might be bactericidal on other organisms. Another place that we see differences here is in the concentration of the chemical used. So if we use a certain amount of chemical, then it may be bacteriostatic, where it would just stop the microbial growth. But then if we use more of the chemical, or a more concentrated amount of chemical, then it may end up being cidal and actually kill all the organisms. And then lastly, the nature of treatment applied. <clears throat> so how do we know when an organism is dead? Uh, we can take a look at their microbial death curve. <clears throat> so this is evaluating the degree of microbial control, um, meaning it describes the, the progress and the effectiveness of a protocol. So this is done in a laboratory to kind of establish these 
numbers or this information. And then we know how long we need to apply something or um, how we need to apply something and, and can take into consideration what we're applying it to. So our microbial death curve. So when exposed to a microbial control, we know that a fixed percentage of microbes will die. So we're talking about a, a specific microbial control, meaning when we, when we apply something, when we expose bacteria to something or particular bacteria to something, we know that a, a certain amount are just going to die. And then this rate of killing remains constant. So the percentage is actually more useful than a number. So rather than saying, you know, 10 million die when you use this much of a chemical, what we're really, the important information is the percentage. If we can say 90%, and that's why in those bottles of Clorox or, or Lysol or whatever, they say 99.9%. .9%. They don't say, you know, each spray can kill 1.5 million bacteria or something like that. Um, and then that rate of killing, again, is going to remain constant. Um, so the percentage is going to stay the same, the percent of organisms that are killed each time. So it's, it's less and less each time. Um, but what we're talking about is the same percentage each time. So we see logarithmic decrease then. We can then come up with some different terms related to this death, um, this micro microbial death curve. And that is decimal reduction time, or DRT, or the D value. This is the amount of time it takes for a protocol to produce a one order of magnitude decrease in the number of organisms. So death of 90% of the population. Uh, so this is one order of magnitude decrease. So our decimal reduction time is the amount of time, so the DRT is going to be in something time, right? So it's going to be a time number. And then that time is telling us this one order of magnitude decrease. So when we have killed 90% of the population, that's the amount of time, the DRT, uh, that we have. So if we look at this image from the text, we can kind of see that. So microbial death is logarithmic. <clears throat> We can see it using a semi-log plot instead of an arithmetic one um, because it's easier to see what we're talking about here because our arithmetic scale shows it here. Um, and then we have our logarithmic scale. So our D value, or our, our DRT, is the time it takes to kill 90% of the population, which is our, our one order of magnitude or one log decrease in the population. So if we see our microbial death curve up here, you can see when we're talking about number of cells, our 10 to the 10, and then our one order of magnitude here is then going to be 90% of the population. This is another 90% of the population, another 90%, another 90%. So between here to here is some amount of time. So here they're saying it's five minutes between the 20 and the 25, for example, but this could be much longer or it could be much shorter. So the effectiveness of a disinfecting agent or microbial, co um, microbial control protocol <clears throat> depends on certain things. So one, the length of time of exposure, right? So, and if we think about that, that's pretty self-explanatory. If we allow some chemical to sit on, say, a laboratory desktop for longer rather than a shorter amount of time, likely it's going to kill more organisms. So we can take that into consideration. Uh, other things, maybe not. So if we took something with some sort of sterilant, then it may need only a second of exposure, and then it'll be just fine. <clears throat> So our effectiveness of our disinfecting agent, um, these are the things that must be factored in when choosing the correct protocol. So what's our length of time of exposure? How long do we have to expose this bacteria or this surface and things um, to this particular protocol? If it's something that, again, I kind of mentioned previously, if it's something that takes, you know, 100 gallons of, of the chemical and it has to sit for five hours, then maybe that's not the best option um, and maybe it's not the most effective. The susceptibility of the agent to the protocol. So we have to take that into consideration when we choose the appropriate protocol. Um, because if we're trying to get rid of certain things, like if, if we're intending on getting rid of um, endospores, for example, then we're not going to use something like hand soap. Because we know that hand soap is not going to get rid of 
endospores. So back are those endospores are therefore not susceptible to hand soap. So we have to take into consideration their susceptibility. This is also something not so simple as um, when we think about biofilms. When we talk about biofilms, we try to utilize things like antibiotics to kill the organisms and biofilms that are causing infection. And that may work for some of the more superficial cells, um, but we know that the cells kind of in the base and middle of a biofilm are not active. And since they're not active, um, then that's not going to work. So they are not susceptible to antibiotics. Uh, the concentration of the disinfectant or the intensity of exposure. So if it takes something that's super, super concentrated to get rid of the things that we're trying to get rid of, maybe that's not the most effective because maybe um, it's something that we use, like our desk or something. Um, maybe, for example, if we're talking about silverware, a concentration of a disinfectant. If we have to use something that is incredibly concentrated that could damage human skin and we put that on our forks, maybe that's not the best option. So we have to take that into consideration. Then the presence of conditions that limit contact between the agent and targeted cells. Um, so in this case, this would be another example uh, related to biofilms. So they have that extracellular matrix or the EPS. That's going to prevent or limit contact between the agent, say in this case an antibiotic, and our targeted cells. Also things like the presence of body fluids. Um, so we have to take that in consideration when we apply things inside of our body. Um, certain tissues might be in the way, other organic debris. And sometimes it just takes increasing the cleaning time uh, for these things. So if we have a biofilm and we just continue to apply some sort of antibiotic, maybe over time it does work. Um, but that might still not be very applicable to inside of the body. That would be more of a laboratory thing because we can't perhaps um, continue applying antibiotics to a person. They may end up um, destroying all of their bacteria in their body that's helpful in the meantime, and that can be very damaging. Um, and we'll actually talk about situations where that occurs on purpose because somebody has something like a C. difficile infection and they actually go in and sterilize their intestines um, to try to get rid of the C. difficile. And then they have to try to recolonate or repopulate those intestines.